Thank you, Norma. Thanks, everyone, for coming. It's great to have a good crowd. Nice for everyone to come. Um, CRT therapy is something we are very passionate about because this is, I think, one of the few things in electrophysiology that does the most for our patients. So it's exciting when you have somebody who's referred to you in heart failure and you know the EF is low and you look at the ECG and you're like, thank goodness the QRS is wide because I can offer this person CRT and our chances of really improving their quality of life is dramatic. So we'll talk about CRT from a very big picture point of view. Um, I never know who's going to be in the audience, but also just um, I think from a very big point, um, picture point of view. And it's, it's helpful too. And to always remember where you are in the um, range of treatment options that are available for any one patient and exactly um, where they are in their clinical status, because then you can match the two. So what we'll do is we'll go through thinking very simply and getting more complex, but it's exactly the thought process that I use and I think many of my colleagues use, even if it's subconscious, um, when we evaluate everyone. And this will lead to what is the latest in CRT therapy, and that is a unique algorithm from St. Jude, um, which is known as multipoint pacing. So by the end, you'll see exactly where multipoint pacing fits into the CRT armamentarium and how we can take advantage of it. So I hope you enjoy. Ask any questions, stop me anytime, make it um, conversational and you know, have lots of fun. So a few disclosures. Disclaimer is of course how you treat your patients and how you program your devices is up to you. I'm not responsible. This should be helpful and I think we understand that. So what is CRT? CRT is treatment for heart failure. Appropriately, appropriate in the setting of a sufficiently depressed ejection fraction and electrically dyssynchronous ventricular function. We have to remember that CRT is the last device option to treat heart failure before patients progress to LVAD or even heart transplant. Last device option. I trained at Columbia Heart Transplant Center, mega center in the United States. And that was very clear to all of us when we had all these patients on VAD and pre and post heart transplant that CRT and the electrophysiologists were your last chance of salvaging those people before they went down that pathway. Um, so let's realize exactly where it is um, in terms of interrupting the heart failure cascade. And that's a picture of rowers and it's supposed to illustrate beautiful synchrony and difficult synchrony because if those guys get out of balance, the paddles crisscross and it's, and, it, and it's a disaster very quickly. So what is the synchrony? It's when things are organized and coordinated, different components working together in a way that functions well and is aesthetically pleasing. You know, one looks good and one is um, a, a group you feel sorry for. So dyssynchrony is mechanical, impaired mechanical coordination that is due to electrical activation um, impairments. So you look at the heart and it's contracting in an abnormal way and it's not the muscle's fault, it's the electrical fault. And so what we have an opportunity here is to correct the electrical fault and electrical dyssynchrony is most easily identified by a prolonged QRS on the ECG. It just means the electrical signal is taking a long time to spread across that heart and exactly how I say to my patients, one side gets the signal to start contracting and starts to contract way before the other side even knows to begin. And as a result, the heart's in conflict with itself. It can't recover and it can't um, um, pump effectively. So QRS prolongation typically due to conduction system abnormalities like a bundle branch block or chronic right ventricular pacing induced conduction delays due to a high RV pacing burden. So if you put a pacing lead in the right ventricle and you pace that heart relentlessly, the QRS is wide, the activation's all right to left, it's very non-physiologic, and if you do that for a, long, for a prolonged period of time, on the order of months to years, some hearts will start to lose function because they just don't tolerate that pacing well. And it's very individual, you monitor these people with serial echoes and you'll catch those people where the pump function starts to really drop, sometimes precipitously drop, and it's due to the pacing and the induced electrical dyssynchrony. So that's another problem. It's a native condition or kind of an iatrogenic condition, if you like. So modes of dyssynchrony, we think of segmental versus global. One portion of the muscle is dysfunction, dysfunctional while the rest of it's normal. And as a result, that one dysfunctional segment affects its neighbors, so they all become somewhat dysfunctional. Or all of the segments can actually have a problem and working together, they all um, 
contribute to the dyssynchrony. So just we just be aware of the difference in our minds, and in every patient we're thinking, is somebody um, global or segmental? And you would expect segmental in somebody who has an ischemic cardiomyopathy and an MI, so they have a region of scar in their ventricle surrounded by relatively normal muscle, and that dyssynchrony would probably be segmental due to the scar, or you could be in a non-ischemic population where just all of the muscle seems to be diseased and equally affected, and it's more of a global um, paradigm. So you're aware of the two um, kind of when you think about who you're going to be implanting and how they might um, respond to your therapy. So they're very real concepts. So dyssynchrony is an electrical problem. That's a nice, normal, brisk ECG. Shows nice, efficient electrical activation of a heart. And then we have dyssynchrony due to bundle branch blocks. So we think in the ventricle, there's a right and left bundle as the main superhighways of electrical activity. Um, and you can have blocks in the right or the left or both, and those manifest differently on the ECG. And depending on where your block is will depend on your eligibility for CRT, and it's also going to affect how we program the device. So I'll just point out those. That is um, left bundle branch block on the left and right bundle branch block on the right. Um, and really it's in lead V1 where you see on the left it's that wide QRS negative and on the right bundle branch block in lead V1, I'm trusting you kind of know where that is. I wish I had a pointer, but it's that wide and it's upright, okay? So left bundle, that's a little bit on the mechanism and you can actually think of how the heart's activating to come up with a left bundle branch block pattern. Similarly on the right, and the ECG manifestation is what it is. So in the setting of a left bundle, we expect someone to really respond to CRT when their QRS is at least 130 milliseconds. Longer the better in terms of predicting response, but for left bundle, 130 and above, CRT is indicated. If it's right bundle, you really want your QRS to be at least 150 before you implant a CRT uh, system or program it on and expect it to help um, heart failure. So we pay attention to the difference. So CRT is achieved when you pace both the right and left ventricles effectively simultaneously or with a small timing offset between um, the two of them. And CRT systems can include ICD protection, that's a CRTD or it can just be um, pacing therapy, which is a CRTP, okay? So we're pacing both ventricles in different contexts. So we say, well, who benefits and who qualifies? CRT benefits heart failure patients with a wide QRS and low ejection fraction in remarkable, remarkable ways that have been reproduced in any number of studies. It improves ejection fraction, heart failure status as measured by a six minute walk time result it decreases heart failure hospitalizations, and it reduces the risk of death. If you, combine, if you compare it to just medical therapy, you have reduced rates of all-cause mortality, cardiac mortality, and heart failure hospitalization. So you're helping people feel better, live longer, stay out of the hospital. You know, it's all, it's all um, good news moving forward for anyone who qualifies. Sorry? It's kind of magic. There's a little bit of magic. So CRTD, you're eject to get a D system, you come with an ejection fraction that's low, less than 35%. You have to have at least class two or class three heart failure status, which is simple. Anyone with a low ejection fraction is almost certainly gonna be in that category, but you need to check. And then the conduction abnormality, if it's a left bundle, we want a QRS above 130. If it's right, above 150 or somebody with a low ejection fraction who's gonna have a high ventricular pacing burden. If you anticipate that and you're implanting a system, you can go right to a CRT system because their ventricle will not do well with all that RV pacing, for example. And then for CRTP, if your ejection fraction is preserved but it's borderline, so it's starting to decline less than 50%, and you have um, a high RV pacing burden or an anticipated high RV pacing burden, you can go to the CRT system. And we're doing those more and more as we're realizing um, the importance of CRTP. So it's three leads for, for a CRT, um, right ventricular lead. It's in the apex for an ICD, and it has to be in the RV apex for an ICD. So the shock coil 
on that lead encompasses all the myocardium and it's going to successfully defibrillate. So you don't have a lot of flexibility there. If it's, if it's a CRTP, you can put that lead a little bit more on the septum because you don't need that shocking ability. And um, atrial lead if they have sinus rhythm, so that's a bit of a no-brainer. And then the ventricular lead, we're trying to put that through the coronary sinus and the cardiac vein venous system out onto the lateral wall. And hopefully a basal lateral LV wall is the spot where we think we're going to get um, the best CRT response. So in the fluoroscopy image, you see a CRT system. The subtlety is in the LV lead. And hopefully you can recognize that as the lead extending out to the, here's the LV lead. And you'll notice this is a bipolar lead. There's two pacing leads. And historically, until very recently, all the LV leads were bipolar. So one of the first major innovations in CRT was the introduction of the quadrupolar pacing lead, which was a St. Jude um, innovation. They were the first to have quadrupolar. And then we'll show then how multipoint is additional to a quadrupolar lead. So that's a bipolar lead, and um, we're not implanting those anymore. So CRT um, advantages with a quadrupolar lead, for example, which we now have. You see in the schematic, here is your LV lead, and it's implanted in an idealized position along the lateral wall of the left ventricle, exactly where you want it. And in reality, you need the perfect vein to get that anatomy, but this is the idealized conception. So you can implant the lead where it's most stable, pace from where you have the best threshold or where you think it's capturing the heart muscle in the best way. If you have phrenic nerve capture, which is the bane of all of this, if the phrenic nerve is running next to where your lead is and you pace there, you'll, you'll give the person intractable hiccups. So now, rather than moving the lead and potentially disrupting the lead, you can just program the different poles. So you just move away from the phrenic nerve. So that's super convenient. Stable lead, program options to get you out of trouble, and all of those are, have been our advantages to CRT pacing. We can pace where we want, where we think it's going to be best. We can get around phrenic nerve capture, and um, life is splendid. So that's, um, that's the advantage of, of the quad lead. Here is quad lead conception versus reality. So we, we kind of saw this picture where you have this idealized quad lead with four poles along the lateral LV wall. And on this venogram, you see that we can totally reproduce the idealized scenario. Here's our main body of the CS, and there's a tributary branch along the lateral wall of the left ventricle, and you put a quad lead in there, and it's going to look just like the picture. So that's perfect. In reality, in some patients, and you won't know till you're implanting, is you'll have this scenario. You have a coronary sinus here, and the vessel that projects to the lateral wall indeed reaches the lateral LV wall, but there's no vein along the lateral LV wall, so you can't implant a, a lead of any sort that's going to go along the lateral LV wall. You're lucky that the tip of the lead just reaches the LV wall. So you have to realize the difference, and in that scenario, you want to pace from the tip of the lead because it's the only pole that's in an advantageous position. Okay, so the quad lead theory versus reality. Sometimes we get the beautiful idealization. Other times we're just trying to make do. And it's important to always have the orientation of that lead in mind when you program these devices. So CRT challenges. The Achilles heel of CRT is the problem of the non-responder. So this beautiful heart failure therapy transforms lives. You know, it's all, it's all roses, except we have non-responders. Um, negative responders, people who actually do worse, and just non-responders in that they don't get any better. Otherwise, you get, have good responders and super responders. You always want a super responder, happy with the responder, but that person who doesn't respond or who gets worse is really disappointing. So that's sort of the, that's sort of the space we're trying to improve on. It's almost like stents. Everyone working in the cath lab, you know, in the 90s, restenosis was the bane of stents, and no one could get around the 30% restenosis rate. So 30% of your volume in the cath lab were restenosed stents. You know, and now with the latest drug eluting stents, restenosis rates are down to, what, 5%, even less. You don't see restenosis anymore. That's kind of what the non-responder space looks like, and we want to shrink it. 
so that um, so that we can um, benefit everyone. So 43% um, CRT non-responders, and that's been consistent across a multitude of studies that have looked at CRT and CRT response. Okay, we consistently shake out at about 30, 40% um, non-responder rates. So we want to do the best we can, and the variables we can control are lead placement. So we try to put the lead in the best spot. And then once we've put the lead in the best spot possible, um, we can program that device. And programming it appropriately and knowing how to change the program and programming and assess the patient as you change the programming is as important a part of CRT therapy as just putting the device um, in the lab. So lead placement, um, we think of it as non-iterative. You put it in the best place possible, but you're not going to be able to change that you know, unless you really decide to reoperate. So think of it as fixed. Programming is iterative. You can change it. It's limited by your lead placement, but you can try different programming and you can change it. And 20 milliseconds can change someone's life. 20 milliseconds can add 20 years to someone's life with appropriate CRT programming. So it's very important. And that's where we'll see the multi-point impacting this, is giving us more programming options. Um, that can, that can really make an important difference. So one more thought on appropriate lead placement. How do you know you have the best lead in the best position? You know you want it to be basal lateral. Lateral wall of the LV towards the base, not at the apex. Studies have shown us that. The thing that we can do in the lab to confirm it's in a good spot is measure this QLV difference. And that is the timing from the onset of the surface ECG to when that LV lead first sees the ventricular signal. And if it sees it late in the QRS, that means you're at a spot that really gets activated late. And by pacing there, you're gonna make that the most early spot. And this heart should then respond the most, right? But if you're at a spot that isn't late, it really gets activated at the start of the QRS. Well, then pacing there isn't gonna make it any earlier and you're not gonna help the patient. So this is something in the lab at the time of implant that you look for, and um, studies have shown that QLV intervals greater than 95 milliseconds really tell you that um, you're in the success zone. So here we see like from the onset of the surface ECG, which, rep which represents all of the ventricle getting activated, to that local activation where you've put your LV lead at the lateral wall of the left ventricle. So you can see that's very late. It's 165 milliseconds late. So we're expecting an excellent response, whereas this one is only 90 milliseconds late. So we would expect a less optimal res res response. And you can move the lead to different veins if you have that option to see which one is latest. And if you were doing that, this is the one that you'd pick based on QLV. So that's a um, very important predictor. Beyond lead placement, the first thing that I do in the lab at the end of the case is ECG guided optimization. You have a left ventricle that's activated late. We want to pace it early. So you say, how much earlier do we want to pace it? You want to pace it earlier so that you can prove by the ECG that you reverse the left bundle branch block. If you show that you reversed it, you know you've really grabbed that myocardium from the lateral wall and you're incorporating it into the heart cycle early. And um, the, you know, there's good literature to, to back this concept. And in my mind, it's the single most important programming option that you can do for somebody. And um, this is literally what you do. You just look at your ECG as you program different LV offsets, 0, minus 20, minus 40, minus 50, 60. And you watch in, in lead V1 as that left bundle going down gets shallower. And here it goes upright for the first time. And beyond that, it's still upright, but it's getting wider. So you want the narrowest one that goes in the right direction. That's the place to um, kind of start. And usually when you do that, you will get a measurable response from your patient um, very early. So that's sort of your first programming option. And that's an article that um, our group wrote up earlier for EP Lab Digest, sharing that concept with the EP community and emphasizing that this is something that you need to consider before you declare your patient to be a non-responder to CRT. Because I've inherited patients from, under, from other labs who have had devices for years, been labeled non-responders because it's not working, 
and you make a few e programming changes based on the ECG and you can turn that per patient in your office into a responder. You know, something they deserve to have much earlier on. So we need to pay attention to these things, particularly in people who are not, um, not responding and we can make important differences. So, knowing all of those features of CRT, now enter multi-point pacing. This is a novel programming option from St. Jude Medical and let's see um, what its role is. And I'll just show you a couple of highlight slides um, giving major clinical results. Then we'll look a little bit more closely at some of the studies that came up with these um, highlights and we'll understand them. So two impulses from one LV lead. Rather than just pacing from one point on the lead, why not pace from several points on the lead? Capture more of the lateral wall of the ventricle simultaneously. And intuitively that makes sense. We think as the, as the electrical wave spreads laterally, it's going to reach the lateral wall in a broad wavefront, right? So if that's how it's used to being activated, then if we're going to reverse that activation, why would we start at one point on the lateral wall to reverse that sequence? It makes much more sense to start that reversal at multiple points as the heart would see it you know, normally. So intuitively, it's a great concept. We just needed the programming option to do it. Now we have it. And so you ask, does that in point of fact work? Um, but it makes a lot of sense and seems to correspond to normal physiology. So there's good evidence for it. Response rates as high as 90% in some series who have really looked at this closely. So remember, we're improving on a 30-40% non-responder rate and some studies showing we can get that responder rate up to 90%. So that's um, very exciting. And on echo, we can measure mechanical benefit. 20% reduction in mechanical dyssynchrony measured by a number of echo parameters. Okay, that's very exciting if you have an algorithm that can do that. 84% hemodynamic benefit. So that's in, a, improvement in acute LV contractility. So we have single site pacing versus two site pacing. And the color diagram show, sort of shows these two pacing sites. And we, in fact, measure um, hemodynamic improvement when we're in position to analyze that closely, like in the lab. And then electrical benefit in terms of reduced activation time and QRS uh, narrowing. So we think we start with a big wide QRS that reflects electrical delay. So we like with CRT to narrow that QRS to show that we've reduced that electrical delay. And studies with multipoint have shown additional reduction in QRS duration um, beyond standard CRT alone. So those, that's just a picture of the different shapes of the quad leads that are available. And you pick them to give you max stability in whatever um, venous anatomy the patient presents you with. In a nutshell, the title of our talk, more options available to make non-response a non-issue, which is where we're trying to go. So focusing a little bit more on those studies, we have um, on the left side, conventional programming. And this is speaking to Randy's question, where you have four pulls on the LV, but you can only pace from one of them at any one time. That's the conventional. And now with multi-point, you can pace truly from two on the lateral wall. Which two do you pick? You can go for greatest anatomic spacing or greatest electrical spacing. And there's ways to measure both of those and um, expect the superior result. So it's something, it's kind of intuitive. You're like, why didn't we think of this a long time ago? And that may be true, but um, you know, the point is it's here, it's here now. So goals of multi-point, pace from two LV sites, which is designed to capture more tissue to improve the pattern of depolarization, engagement of myocardium around scar, which is very important. So you have a scar and you're pacing on the edge of that scar. The other side of the scar isn't going to see your pacing stimulus for a long time. So if you can put more options around an area of scar, you can stand to benefit the ischemic patient much better. And we've seen with that improvement in hemodynamics and um, improvement in resynchronization. So two, pacing from two LV sites on one CRT lead, and this is the same CRT lead that we've been using for a long time. We know and love, it's not new technology. There's no new hardware for multipoint. It's all programming algorithms and um, pacing abilities. So that's an, that's an, 
an important point. And again, another um, picture of the cans, both the CRTP, which is the Allure, and the Quadra Assura, which is CRTD, and then the three shapes of the St. Jude leaves that are available. So you can pick whichever one you think will go in your patient's vein. And I'll tell you from a technical standpoint, nothing goes into impossible veins like the St. Jude Quad. So that's the go-to lead for, for tough veins, it really is. And um, we, a lot of us have learned that the hard way, but it really is fantastic. So the investigation, the IDE study to have this approved by the FDA had to demonstrate that the compared to standard programming, we could improve hospitalization, EF, and mortality. So the FDA agreed that Multipoint did offer that and therefore unleashed it on the American population. And we have these programming options. And as I said, how do you program a Multipoint pacing system there's basically two concepts. You can go for greatest anatomical spacing, so you pace from one to the tip of the lead and the, and the most proximal poles, and then you're covering the most myocardium, or you can say, what's the widest electrical spacing? So you record from both of those leads, and you can say, this one's getting activated earliest, and that one's getting activated the latest on this lead, so those two poles represent the greatest disparity, so why don't we pace to neutralize the greatest disparity? Those are your sort of two out of the box, quick and simple ways to program multi-point from a practical standpoint. So we'll see studies proving the concept where they were doing hemodynamic monitoring, advanced echo studies of dyssynchrony, those are great, proves that it works, not available you know, to most of us who, who practice in a community setting. So this is some of those studies, you know, showing with activation mapping, electroanatomic mapping, that if you do the multi-point pacing, that you will improve um, contractility, shrink QRS dur duration, decrease the endocardial activation time, capture more LV mass more quickly in a way that improves your hemodynamics, QRS duration, and activation pattern, gives you a better clinical response. So it's nice to actually do that mapping data and see that work. And um, those studies have been done. And then with echo measures of dyssynchrony, we can see that with the best multipoint pacing, you can reduce um, echo measures of dyssynchrony, which is usually tissue Doppler um, imaging. So those studies have been done and benefits been demonstrated. Here we have a patient who's in the cath lab where we're recording pressure volume loops in a heart failure patient and we're looking at baseline in the dotted lines how diseased that pressure volume loop is and then we turn on best conventional CRT programming and improve that pressure volume loop as you would anticipate doing and then taking the additional step of enabling multipoint pacing and seeing another significant improvement in the pressure volume loop where you have nice reductions in diastolic pressure indicating you know, improved, um, improved relaxation without any compromise and the same or better um, systolic function. So you see that nice incremental effect of multipoint pacing demonstrated with direct hemodynamic measurements in the EP lab or in the cath lab. So we get convinced that it works and we're left with the challenge of how to come up with the same programming when we don't have our patients um, in the cath lab. So there you see the improvement there demonstrated by the red arrow. 12-month follow-up. On the, on the left, we see conventional programming. Um, these are the acute responders. And here is a group randomized to multipoint pacing. 76 acute response versus 57. The non-responder rate dropping from 43 to 24%. So these are people who both got implanted at the same time. One gets programmed conventionally, one gets programmed with multipoint. So it's exciting to see the multipoint group do better in that regard. And here again at 12 month follow up, conventional programming versus multipoint. This dark blue are the super responders, 34% with multipoint versus 14 with conventional the traditional responder rate being the same, 43 and 43, with a reduction in your non-responders and really a marked reduction in your negative responders. So across all categories, really an, um, you know, a nice increase in the response rates with optimally programmed multipoint. 
And then here is a slide where the patients are implanted with CRT. They get conventional programming, best programming for a year. And after one year of CRT therapy, multi-point pacing is enabled and you follow them forward in time for additional benefit. So that is really interesting. So here are these people across 12 months in terms of LV and systolic volume. And as you would expect, and systolic volumes tend to remodel and decrease during that period. Some people are non-responders, but we know CRT works and we prove that it works. And we measure that, so we expect at 12 months, up to 16 months, the, the multipoint is programmed on and you see that those same patients have these additional benefit in terms of end systolic volume due to additional beneficial remodeling in response to the new algorithm. So it's very exciting. And paralleling that increases in LV ejection fraction. So here we see across 12 months, nice steady improvements in LV ejection fraction. And we all say, hurrah, CRT works. We improved another patient, saved another life. Turn on multipoint, and from 12 months to 16 months, we see this additional steeper improvement in um, LV ejection fraction, meaning we're giving our patients additional benefit. So really nice in the same individuals, sort of in that crossover design to see um, people doing much better. So cases from our program, we have implanted, I would say, 10 multi-point devices. And this technology has only been available to us since the spring. So we're now coming to that phase in our patient's um, profile where we are turning on multi-point. So we're, our own experience with the additional benefit of multi-point is still um, in its infancy, but it's exciting to be at this position and see what else um, patients can gain. I'll show you one example quickly. 80-year-old female, severe COPD on HOMO2, profound bradycardia. She had a biotronic dual chamber pacemaker since 2008, paced 100%. Her ejection fraction went from 60 to 65 at the time of implant to 40 to 45% now when she's at ERI. So we want to upgrade her to a CRTP pacing system when we um, choose St. Jude with the quad lead available for CRTP and for multipoint. At the time of her implant, we do what we always do, and that's ECG optimization. And we found that an LV offset zero we thought was best for her electrically. And then multipoint we enabled just this past week after four months of conventional CRT um, P therapy. I'll so I'll show you a few details early on. First is, um, what is her final lead position? So here are her venograms, and you see an RAO. Here we have that quad lead, and it's really nice and mid-ventricular to basal ventricular. So we're really on the mid to basal wall, which is very attractive. We're not down here, which would be apical and has a negative response. So in that regard, it's nice. In LAO, we see that the lead sits like this, and the distal poles of the lead are most lateral, whereas the proximal poles are not as lateral. So if I had only one pole to pace from, obviously I'd choose these ones because they're most lateral. And with multipoint, if I enable both of these, I'm wondering a little bit, would that be advantageous or not? So it's going to be interesting to see. And um, you know, here we see how that lead would look on a chest x-ray where you can't get the same sense of orientation, but truly on that basal position and um, you know, at least lateral, a lateral direction along the LV. So here are our pictures of her from our um, ECG optimization, and this is literally what it looks like. You, you, um, you look at RV only pacing, which was her baseline, so in, and then you just program offsets. Zero, minus 20, minus 40, minus 60. You print an ECG and you watch the QRS evolve. And you pick one for narrowness and best morphology. So curious in her, at baseline with RV only pacing, she had a right bundle branch block. You'd expect a left bundle normally, but you can see consistent with activity coming from the right ventricle, lead one is markedly positive. So it's truly a right to left activation in spite of that right bundle pattern, which is hard to explain. So we add enough LV offset to reverse lead one. 
lead V1 is going to stay positive, but we at least want to see some activity coming away from the lateral wall of the left ventricle without then prolonging the QRS. And we at least know that that lead is nicely, you know, recruiting um, ventricular myocardium. So we pick that as um, initial programming. So this is all done at the time of implant four months ago. And then she comes in this past week and we change her from conventional to multi-point pacing. So before multi-point, she comes in, her cure restoration is 152 milliseconds. Here's that same negativity in lead one that we thought was nice when we originally implanted her. We turn on multi-point, her QRS shrinks a little bit down to 148. And we see we still have that reversal from lead one, but consistent with what we know about the lead position, it's not quite as steeply negative as it is um, with, with the conventional. Now the question is, what's gonna benefit her in the long run? Was our simplistic thinking that the conventional waveform looked most desirable gonna hold out in terms of clinical benefit? Or is capturing more myocardium for all the reasons that we saw to be advantageous um, going to help this lady? So we march forward in time, encouraging that the QRS in point of fact narrow. If it was wider, I would be immediately discouraged. But at least it's not prolonged and it is in point of fact um, narrow. So we'll see. You know, if we were giving this talk several months from now, which hopefully we'll do again, we'll have at least um, some objective and um, some objective and, and some qualitative clinical uh, results from this work.